we turn to the Word of God for the message, I invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Romans chapter 1. And the title of the message today is, The Just Shall Live by Faith. The just shall live by faith. So let's, I feel appropriate, let's just bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing on the service. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace, your mercy toward us. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from our sins. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit, Lord, to guide us into all truth. And now as we sit ready to hear from you through your word, prepare us to hear your message to understand it. Give us the strength to obey it. Empower me, Lord, your servant, to speak it, to explain it clearly, plainly, that those listening would be able to understand. We just ask that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out your blessing upon each one here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostles, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name and among whom ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established, that is, that I may be comforted or encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Simply want to work through this, uh, this text here in, in, in uh, three simple points. First off, we have Paul's introduction. The book of Romans begins by Paul, the author, introducing himself. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. And the meaning of this word servant, I think, is important for us to understand because sometimes we, I think our English language doesn't always convey the meaning um, or we have different ideas of it. Paul is a servant in the fact or in the sense that he has been purchased by Christ. He has been purchased and is owned by his master, Jesus Christ. He obeys his master will, his will. And another, maybe a better word, nowadays we would understand he is a slave of Jesus Christ. He has no will of his own, but the will of his master. Paul actually describes all Christians in, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. All believers like this. Remember what he says there? You are bought with a price. You are not your own. Sorry, I said it backwards. You are not your own. You are bought with a price, so glorify God with your bodies. So just as Paul is a servant purchased by Christ, all believers are purchased by Christ. Acts 20, verse um, 28, 
Paul is actually speaking to the Ephesian elders there, and he tells them, you know, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which you, the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We are a purchased people. And that's why we call Jesus our Lord, our Savior, our Master. We are not our own, but belong body and soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul did here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Later he'll talk about how all Christians are called of Jesus Christ in, in our text here, but he'll explain the calling of, of God later on in the, in, in the book, which we, Lord willing, will go through, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but he's called to be an apostle. What does it mean? To be an apostle. Well the book of Acts explains a little bit to us. W when Judas had betrayed our Lord. He had taken his life. And the disciples. Which were now the apostles. They are looking to replace his, his position. Because they had seen in the Old Testament. That he should be replaced. And they turn to the Psalms. In Acts 20, 1 verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms. May his camp be desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. That's Judas. But then, another quote from the Old Testament, let, uh, let another take his office. And here's the criteria of what it took to be an apostle, one to replace Judas. It needs to be one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, or, resur or uh, not re uh, uh, his ascension. And one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And so they put forward, forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which one of these you, two you have chosen. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So an apostle is one who's been a disciple of Jesus. From the time of his baptism of John. To the time where he ascended into heaven. And he needed to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ. And he needed to be called by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul actually doesn't meet all these criteria. He wasn't a disciple of Christ while Christ was on this earth. And he didn't witness his resurrection. And uh, before I even get into more of that, a little side note, sometimes we use the words disciple and apostle interchangeably, and we don't really distinguish between the two. There is a difference, though. And a disciple is simply a student, someone who's learning. An apostle is one who has been sent with a message, and that message is their master's message. They are sent with the, the very authority. They speak with the authority of their master. So an apostle is one who is carrying the message or the authority of the one who has sent him, and that is why the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. That's why we don't have apostles continuing. There's no apostles today. There was no apostles after those apostles. When they passed away, it was, it was the end of the apostleship era because they laid the foundation. Christ, the cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20, and the apostles, the prophets and the apostles, right? And so... Their message is Christ's message. Paul's message is Christ's message. So back to Paul. He, he actually fails these two requirements of being an apostle. He hadn't been a disciple. He hasn't witnessed the resurrection. But the book of Acts records for us on three occasions, a threefold witness, how he was called as an apostle by Christ himself. And Christ himself revealed himself to Christ as the risen Christ. And he was to be a specific apostle, one to the Gentiles, to bring those non-Jews to faith in Christ. So he speaks with the authority 
of Jesus. That's what it means to be an apostle. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ. He's set apart for a specific task. He's set apart for the gospel of God, verse 1. He's been set apart, called to proclaim God's gospel. God's gospel meaning good news. Paul is simply the messenger whom God has called and set apart to proclaim a message that comes from God himself. The gospel of God, verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right at the very beginning of his letter, Paul goes to one thing that is the most certain thing in all of life. The Word of God. You will find the message that I am sent to, to, to bring to you, the good news of God, something that God has promised in His Word, in the Holy Scriptures, in the Old Testament. So if you, if you doubt my message, go to the Old Testament. You will find it there. God has promised beforehand, through His prophets, recorded it for us in His Holy Scriptures. Remember Jesus. He has just been resurrected from the, from the tomb, from His death on the cross. And there's two very discouraged disciples walking down the road to Emmaus, talking about all these events that had taken place and how they had had such great hopes for Jesus. Now He was crucified. He was dead. And Jesus miraculously joins them on the road there. They don't recognize who He is. And remember what Jesus said to them. He says, Oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart. What were they slow of heart for? He's slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are the books of Moses, and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, how they all pointed to him. And he breaks bread with them. Their eyes are open. And as soon as their eyes are open, Jesus disappears. And they say to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us? When we walked in the way and he opened the scriptures to us. Oh, that our hearts would burn within us as those disciples, as Christ is revealed to us from his scriptures. It may be today that you're here and that you don't know the Christ of the Scriptures. That you've never had your heart changed by Him. I pray that by the grace of God, that He will, by the power of His Holy Spirit, that He would just put, He would ignite a flame in your heart. A desire, a passion, a longing, a yearning to know Christ to know His message and that you would receive His message as it's proclaimed simply and plainly even to you today. What is the gospel of God? What's the good news of God? Well, verse 3, number 1, it concerns His Son, Jesus Christ. So the gospel is about God's Son who we see here in the text, was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Absolutely critical that he's a descendant of David because the Old Testament prophets prophesied he would come from the line of David, he would come from the seed of David. The Gospels, Matthew and Luke, you read them, you the beginnings of them, they make it absolutely crystal clear. They have an airtight argument that this Jesus came from the line of David. He was as David himself prophesied in the Psalms. David's son. At the same time. He was not only David's son. He was David's Lord. So Christ was the descendant of David. According to the flesh. Jesus was fully human. He is born of the seed of David. But he is not just human. Verse 4. He is declared. To be the son of God. With power according to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection of the dead. 
When God the Holy Spirit raised the body of Jesus from the tomb after His death on the cross, God was announcing to the world, this is my Son. Today, maybe you're here and you're questioning Jesus. By what evidence do we believe that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God? By the very witness, the testimony of God Himself raising His Son from the dead. The power of the resurrection. Conquering death. The power belonging to God Himself. God alone can raise dead people to life. He proves to us without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was indeed the Son of God and history has recorded it for us so that we would be able to see and believe in the witness of God and His Son. And it is from Jesus, God's Son, that Paul here, in verse 5, has received grace and apostleship. Why? For what purpose? Well, it is for two reasons. It is to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations. And it is for Christ's name. His apostleship is to bring about obedience or faith in Jesus Christ among all nations. And it is to, in, through bringing obedience of faith to all nations, it will bring glory to God. Paul's desire that those in Rome who have been called by God would receive the grace and the peace of God, a peace that is, Cornelius read it this morning in the scriptures, an eternal peace. You know, we can be in the most turmoil currently in our personal lives in this earth, and yet we can absolutely have the assurance of the peace of God in our hearts, an eternal peace, a peace that, you know, the battle between, between sin and and God is over. We now have a peace with God. So that's Paul's introduction. Secondly, we have Paul's greeting. In verse uh, 8 here, Paul greets the church at Rome with a thankful heart. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of through the whole world. He is thankful because they've got a reputation of faith in Christ and it's known throughout the whole world. He is speaking of the known, the known world in, in Paul's time there. Paul had never been to Rome and yet he heard of how their faith had an impact. It had made a difference in their lives. It wasn't something that was just secret, but it actually was lived out on a day-to-day -day basis. Verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Paul is, as an example for us, he is constantly praying for other believers. We too need to be praying for those in our own congregations, in those out other congregations in our area. We need to be praying for those who are on the mission field or in other lands. But Paul is specifically praying and hoping that he would be able to come to them somehow. He wants to visit them. By God's will, somebody wants to come to Rome. Those of you who've studied the scripture for a while, you've read through the book of Acts, you will remember the Lord answered his prayer mightily. Maybe not quite the way he had thought. Isn't that how it is often in our lives? We pray for something, we pray for something, and you know, we don't even recognize the answer sometimes. Paul went to Rome in chains, a prisoner, a prisoner of Rome. Yet he had a great ministry there. Two years, he's in a house arrested, and he, he could receive everyone who would come to him and, uh, and, and, and share the word of God with them. But why did Paul have this deep passion or desire to meet the Roman Christians? Verse 11, he is longing to see them, and this is the reason, so that he could impart some spiritual gift 
to them so, so that they would be established, that they would be strengthened in their faith. Paul's concern that they don't just start well as a Christian. This isn't just a, a flash in the pan, so to say. It's just that we just begin well. His desire is they would be established, that they would grow and mature in their faith. And that's the reason he wrote this letter. That's why in God's providence, we now read this letter today so that we too would be able to grow in maturity in our faith more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ. But Paul has another reason for his desire to visit them. And that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. He, he wants to be encouraged. Paul, like you and I, need encouragement. Never, never forget that, brothers and sisters. You being here today is a huge encouragement to the one sitting beside you, to me. We encourage each other in the faith. Not just by being here, but by living together, by loving each other, by praying for each other. But we all need encouragement. Helping each other along life's journey. Verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, or I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. You know, I've often wanted to come, I've often intended to come to you. But you know, so far I've, I've been prevented. The Lord hasn't allowed me to come. And I want to come because I want to reap some, some fruit or some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Or Gentiles. Verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So Paul here says, you know, I, I, I have this debt. It's, it's both to Greeks, and then he explains what they are. They are the wise, those are the educated people. And to the barbarians, those are those who haven't been educated, the, the unwise. And, and I'm, I'm in debt to both of them, to all of them. Well, he's not in debt financially. He doesn't owe them money, but he has this debt or this obligation that comes from his apostleship that he's been given by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been set apart by God as a, an apostle to the Gentiles, and as long as he's alive, he has this debt, this obligation that he has to share the good news, the gospel of God, with them. And it is ultimately because of his indebtedness that he is so eager to come to them in verse 15. Look at how he says it. So as, as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. You know, all of my, my being, every part of me is ready to proclaim this good news. But there's a reason why he's ready. Verse 16. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is he not ashamed? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, well, in the gospel, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul, he, he introduces himself here. He is, he is a servant of Jesus Christ. He's been called as this apostle, set apart for this specific task to bring this good news of, of God for the obedience of faith, for the sake of Christ's name. He's greeted the, the Romans. He thanks the Lord for them, for their faith that's known throughout the whole world. He tells them that he's, he's under obligation and he's in debt or he's eager to proclaim, preach the gospel to them in order that he might have a reap a harvest among them as he has done in many other uh, Gentile locations. And thirdly, here we have Paul's message. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. May that be the same in our lives. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel no matter how hostile the culture was toward it. Sometimes we get, we get to that point where we're like, well, you know what, nobody really wants to hear this message anymore, so we just, I'll just be a secret Christian. No, Paul, he lived in a time where it was hostile to the Christians. And yet he gloried in it. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, let the one who boasts 
boast in the Lord. He was not ashamed to be known as a Christian. Remember the, the stern warning of Jesus. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Oh, we need to heed this warning. We want to be secret Christians, maybe around our co-workers or our friends, maybe our family. Sometimes if we even say a word about Christ, we, we're immediately accused of, oh, you just think you're holier than me or you're more righteous than me. Or try, accused of trying to shove religion down someone's throat. And we can be tempted to be embarrassed about our faith. Not Paul. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. Think back. You think back in your own life of the times when you've been ashamed to be known as Christ's follower. Ashamed of the gospel. It is because you have not grasped the truth of this these few verses. May the Spirit of God open our eyes and give us a, a truer understanding of these verses. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. These two verses are actually the main theme, the thrust of this this book of Romans, and I think it's important we take a little bit of a closer look at them. I'm not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel of Christ. From the very beginning of the letter, Paul is clear that Christ is at the very center of the gospel. Look how he describes the gospel, the good news, verse 2. You know, he's promised this gospel beforehand. He promised it, God promised it in the, through the prophets. The prophets wrote it down in the Old Testament. The gospel concerns his son, verse 3 and 4. His son who was the descendant of David in the flesh. But he was not just a human. He was also fully human, but he was fully God. He was declared to be the son of God in power. How? Well, the Holy Spirit did, by, did it by raising him from the dead. God's righteousness is revealed about his son, Jesus Christ. And it all centers on him. We see that there in verse 3 and 4. It centers on Jesus Christ, our Lord. He tells us that Jesus Christ was promised. God promised him. The ministry of Jesus came about because God had promised long beforehand in the Holy Scriptures. It was the plan of God from the beginning, from before the beginning. It was always God's plan. So the Gospel is the good news about God's Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, of the message of Christ, because it is the power of God. That word power there is actually where we would get our, our English word dynamite from. It is the dynamite of God. It is the omnipotence of God, the, the all-powerfulness of God himself who alone can save a man or save a woman from sin and from eternal death and can give them eternal life. God's word is clear that you know you can't be you can't be spiritually changed, saved, rescued by the church, by religion, by your own merits, your own good deeds. You can't even be saved by keeping God's law. Which, actually, God gave his law to us for the very purpose to show us how we couldn't save ourselves. How we were so inadequate, so, are, are so helpless to meet his righteous requirements. The law was not given to save us, but to show us our sin, to drive us to a saving knowledge, or to, to, to saving grace of God. Only the power of God is able to overcome our sinful nature and impart spiritual life. Paul says to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, a familiar verse to, I, I think, most of us. He says, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
As I speak here today, if this message of Jesus, who came and died for our sins and rose again in the power of the Holy Spirit and ascended to the right hand of God, if that message to you is foolishness, who would ever believe that? I can assure you, friends, you're perishing eternally. Eternal death. But to those of you who are being saved, Paul says it is, that's what he's saying in verse 16 here of our text, it is the power of God unto salvation. It is only in the gospel, in Christ alone, where we find salvation from sin, from Satan, from judgment, from wrath, from spiritual death. Salvation through Christ brings deliverance from our spiritual infection of sin. Actually, not, not, I shouldn't even say infection because that's, that just sounds like we could get better ourselves from, from spiritual death because of our sin. Think of or remember the message of the angel. Joseph is struggling to take Mary as his wife. He's found out she's pregnant. They are not married. He thinks she's been unfaithful. The angel comes to him and he gives him a message. And remember what he says. He says, she will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will, what? Save his people from their sins. He will save his people from his sins. That's why Jesus came. Later on, Paul will say in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 here, that God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath, from God's wrath, through Jesus. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To believe something, what does it mean to believe something? Well, it means to absolutely trust in it. That you can totally rely on it. That you can have complete faith in it. Salvation is believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior. Salvation comes to us when we give up of our, on our own goodness, on our own good works, on our own uh, worldly knowledge and wisdom, and, and we repent of our sins and we trust, believe in, by faith, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And salvation, Paul says, is to the Jew first. Why? What's this special treatment of the Jews? Well, it's to the Jews first because God had planned it that way. God had planned that it was through the Jews. Remember Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Through the Jews, they would, salvation would come. Jesus comes as a Jew through the line of David. But it's not just for the Jews. It is for the Jews, absolutely. But it's for the Greek also. Salvation, see, has no borders, has no walls gates. It has no country, no nation, no people, no race. It's for everyone who believes. Today, if you are here and you hear the word of God and you believe in him, you can be assured that you are his child, that you have been saved from the wrath of God. For in it, in the gospel, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, and he quotes Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. Righteousness means to be right, just. The gospel reveals the rightness, the pureness, the absolute perfectionness of God. How God, is ways, God and his ways are pure and right. Paul says to the Philippians, you know, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, notice, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness from God that depends on faith. The righteousness Paul is speaking about here in Romans is a righteousness that is from God. God gives it to us. He imparts it to us, to those who believe. It is His righteousness that is granted to us. The last ver uh, a phrase in verse 17 is actually a quote from the Old Testament Scriptures in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And I, I don't have time, but I'm going to briefly uh, just maybe explain the circumstances of, of Habakkuk. He is a prophet of God. He is uh, called, as prophets were, to bring the message of God to his people. He knows the promises of God. And he looks around, and he is discouraged. He is confused. And he begins to question God. Sound familiar? That's us, brothers and sisters. So often we question God. We wonder, where are you, God? This is what you've promised. How come I don't see it? Where, you know, what, what's going on? And, and, and here, God's people, they, they had turned away from God. Uh, the nations around them are prospering. They are unrighteous. They are wicked. They are vile. And yet, it seems like they are, they are the ones who get all the blessings. Justice has departed from the land. Violence just prevails everywhere. Righteous people are suffering. And Habakkuk says, you know, God, where are you on all this? What's going on? Why aren't you saving your people? And God, the promise-keeping God, he comes to Habakkuk and he says, wait. Be patient. He gives him a vision. And he says, you know, the vision I gave you in the, before, he says, you know, that vision, it will come. For the, still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then God makes this, this contrast. He, he makes a contrast between two types of people, the, the nations around them, and specifically the Chaldeans who, who were going to come and actually basically destroy Israel and Judah. They're, they're proud. They're, they're a proud people. They, they have conquered many lands and they think that they are self-sufficient and that, that they can save themselves. And he says in verse 4, he says, Behold, the proud, or his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But, here's the contrast, the just shall live by faith. And that's where Paul is taking his quote from. The Chaldeans were a proud people, a puffed up people. Their great accomplishments of, of, of conquering land and peoples and they were prospering and they thought, you know what? Nothing can stop us now. Look at what we've all accomplished. But the Chaldeans aren't the only ones who are puffed up with pride self-sufficiency. Look at our secular world today. We are going to, according to our leaders in, in, around the world and our politicians, we are going to uh, save our planet by different policies, by controlling different things, by taxation, and you name it. They're a proud people. They absolutely believe they are going to do this. But what about the religious people of, of the day? They, too, are proud people because, you know, if we keep our traditions, if we keep our customs and we do this religiously, you know, we will be good. We will, we will, we will make it. What about our own hearts? What about our own self? Pride has a way of not distinguishing. Pride is greedy. Pride makes us never content, never satisfied. It makes us unthankful. Pride leads us to disappointment. It leads us to ruin and ultimately to eternal death. But God says here, and here's the contrast, the just, though, are different. The righteous are different. They live by faith. See, faith is a lifestyle. 
it's actually the exact opposite of being puffed up, of being proud, of being self-sufficient. To live by faith means to believe God's word and obey it no matter how we feel, what we see around us, or what the, the consequences may be by believing it. To live by faith means we trust God because no one is more trustworthy than Him. To live by faith means that we crucify ourselves, we crucify our own pride and our flesh, and we trust God with our whole being, as in Habakkuk's day. God said to him, you know what, Habakkuk, you need to wait. You need to live by faith. Don't live like the others around you, the nations around you who are living by puffed up and proud in their own self-sufficiency. Even though you can't see what I'm all doing here, what I've told you, what I've shown you in the vision is going to come to pass. Live by faith. Paul in his day to the Romans. You know, it's looking pretty dire here in Rome. There isn't much love for the Christians. It looks like there won't be many of you left soon. Live by faith. To those of us here in Mormon Saskatchewan today, are we living by faith? Truly. Trusting the Lord with our whole heart, mind and soul. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Do you know Him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, put your faith in Him today. Trust Him. For He is trustworthy. For whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the call on our lives that you have called us to be a people set apart for the glory of your name. That as you save us, Actually, you bring glory to you. As we serve you, you get honor and glory for the great work of salvation you have get, uh, wrought within, within your Son for us. Lord, give us a heart, a heart like the Apostle Paul, one that would love your people, one that would care for them, would pray for them continually. Help us to live out the reality of our salvation in our lives as a thankful people, a grateful people. Those who are, like Paul, eager to share the good news of your son's salvation, which is offered to everyone who believes. May we never forget that. That there's no boundaries to the good news. There's no, nothing that hinders it. That it is for all who believe in you. Grant us the strength to live by faith as your children, as you have called us to trust you with our whole lives. This we pray in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen. Oh.
For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is He your Lord, Savior? Have you received the gift of eternal salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Let's bow for closing prayer and benediction. Lord God, as we come before you at the close of the service, we want to remember not just ourselves here, but we want to remember all our brothers and sisters in the Lord around, this, around the world. Lord, we think especially of those who are going through great conflicts. We think of you, the Ukrainians. We think of especially, we've got members of our church here who have family there. We pray for their family specifically. Lord, it has been a long journey. Yet, we look at our, your faithfulness. You have kept them safe. We pray for continued safety. We pray that the church would continue to grow. We pray for those in Israel. Lord, we pray that this would be a time of great awakening, that they, the ones who would have had your word, the promises first, that they would turn to you and know you as your Savior. And, and around the world, Lord, there's, there's uh, civil unrest in many places, even in our own lands and North America. We ask that your church, Lord, would continue to be faithful, proclaiming your good news, and that you, Lord, as we know you are, are always faithful, are continuing to bring those uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. We want to close and ask your blessing here with the benediction, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again for coming. May God's blessing go with you. You're dismissed.